Hey, hey, period party people. It's so great to be back with you again this week. I am interviewing Dr. Michael Geis. He is a traditional osteopathic physician specializing in neuromuscular medicine and osteopathic manipulative medicine. And his practice focuses on treating complex chronic pain, musculoskeletal, and sports-related injuries with a specific practice focus on sleep disordered breathing, airway, and dental health. Dr. Geis is special because he is my osteopathic physician and I have been working with him in conjunction with a dentist and myofunctional therapist as I have gone through this whole tongue lip tied journey that you might be aware of because I've been talking about it quite a bit on the podcast and on social media. Anyway, I wanted to have Dr. Geis on the podcast because there is so much misinformation floating around about oral restrictions and all of these problems that I've been dealing with. And I've gotten lots of pushback about how these oral ties don't really mean anything. Anyway, he is going to break down just how critical they can be to our overall health based on his own experience with having a tie and one of his children. So he shares that story in the very beginning and it's really profound. He also talks about his own experience as an osteopath when he noticed that patients or some patients just weren't getting better even though they were doing all the right things. And that's where the oral ties came in. So this is a really good conversation about all of the different ways, like I said, that a tongue and lip tie can affect our overall health as children and as adults, plus how to get the help that you actually need with the right team. So that's a big one, right? We don't wanna just go into this and do it and not be prepared for it prior to the surgery and then after the surgery. Anyway, I really hope you enjoy this episode. It was a pleasure to record this with him and If it's helpful to you, please let me know on Instagram or leave a review here on Apple Podcasts. Thank you so much for being here, and I look forward to hearing from you. Hi, Dr. Geis. Hello. How are you? I'm doing well, thank you. How are you doing? I'm so good. I'm so happy to talk to you, and I you know, really am so grateful for all the help that you have provided to me, and I'm just happy to have you on because I really feel like this is information that people really need to know about. And it's something my whole tongue lip tie thing is not something I knew about um, until I was quite an older adult. And so I wanted to talk about that first. You know, I know you also had a tongue tie and um, how did you figure out that you did have that? And um, I know you also had a child or maybe all of your kids, I can't quite remember, had issues as well. So can you talk a little bit about your story? Yeah, I... um... I had um, two children right off the bat, very symptomatic from, you know, oral dysfunction. One of them couldn't feed. Um, He was dropping weight in percentiles. He actually went down to zero percentile. The pediatrician pulled me out of the room and he said, I can't say this in front of your wife, but, you know, he's dangerously low. He's zero percentile. He's failing to thrive. You know, he's just not feeding. And we had tried everything from different handholds and different positions, different bottles, nipple shields, you know, everything that we could think of from supplements and helping with milk production and whatnot. Um, and, and it wasn't helping. And at the same time, my older child, who's about five and a half years older, was struggling with ADHD. He was struggling with sleep disruption. He was disrupt, uh, struggling with headaches. It was a colleague of mine in down in New York City, and she said, you know, I need, I think you need to go see this dentist in town. And so, full disclosure, I was like, what the hell is a dentist going to do here when the pediatrician, the pulmonologist, I'm a doctor, we're not figuring this out, what's a dentist going to do? So I went, and the dentist looked at me and said, your one son has an airway problem, the other one has a tongue type, and it's all your fault, because you do too. So I kind of walked out of there, like taking a step back and just being like, what just happened? And what is he talking about? And, and all of this seems to make sense, but I had no idea. So my father-in-law's an ENT and, and I reached out to him and he came in and did an evaluation. He said, oh yeah, he's got a tongue tie. And he's like, let's just cut it right here. And he pulled out a pair of scissors in the living room. And he's like, I'll just snip it. What? So like, Wait a minute. What about sterile? What about clean environment? What about stretching? And he said, oh, you don't have to do stretching it's fine, it heals on its own. 
And that's at that point where I was like, wait a minute, maybe I need to go back to this dentist. And that's kind of where things started. I, I watched my son go from zero percentile, unable to feed. My wife had knives in her breasts every time he latched to a, you know, a screaming irritable kid to, um, he's now off the charts, he's 110 percentile, but within three months he was feeding, he had gained all his weight back, he was actually kind of overweight for the pediatrician, but a simple procedure that changed the use of his mouth enabled him to thrive. We went into that same kind of uh, process with my older son, he ended up having a tongue tie release and asking him about it he was able to use his arms. He was able to grab on a monkey bar for the first time ever and swing from bar to bar to bar. And in his description, he's like, my arms work my better. My head stopped hurting. My neck stopped hurting. And I started going like, how can a tongue tie release do this for these kids? Let me go be the guinea pig. And then I was the guinea pig. So I had multiple car accidents when I was a younger teen. I played multiple sports. I had around 15 concussions. And I started with chronic pain and chronic neck um, pain since I was 15. So I was on Percocets and, and muscle relaxers at 16 until my 20s. Um, I was miserable. I tried everything that the orthopedist said to do. I tried everything that the neurologist said to do. My dad was a doctor, so all these doctors were helping us out and nothing worked. And so eventually, I got acupuncture for the first time, and that was the first time that my pain started to dissipate, but it would always come back. So I started looking for alternative measures, and acupuncture was a big thing that would help me, but it would give me change for about a day or two. I had massage, I had chiropractic, I had manual stuff, and that would feel really good, and that's what drove me to go into osteopathic school to learn more about the structure and the function and how the head and pain is related to all this airway and tongue tie stuff. Long story short, I was dependent on manual treatments. I was dependent on acupuncture and manipulation weekly in order to be functional. And if I missed a week and the person who was treating me wasn't there, I was having migraines, I was throwing up in a wastebasket and I couldn't function at work. And this was around the same time that my kids were going through all this. And so I ended up having a phrenectomy and I, I literally feel honestly that that was the best medical decision I've ever made in my life. Like that changed everything because the next day after the release, we went to Lake George with my kids. And I spent you know, an hour or two holding a kid's hand or putting a bottle in somebody's mouth while we were driving. And it was the first time that my arms weren't going numb. So I had something called thoracic outlet syndrome where you move your arm a certain way and your arms go numb. And I had had that my whole life and thoracic outlet syndrome was gone. My neck pain started dissipating and I would say I'm chronic pain free or neck pain cured from having a release. So then obviously you go back to the clinic and you start looking at your patients and you're saying like, who needs this? How do I figure that out? And how can you help more people? And there was a subset of my population of patients that I was sitting there going, when I would get treated, I'd feel better. And about an hour later or a couple of days later, it would all come back. Mm -hmm. So when I would treat patients in the, in the clinic, 30% of my patients I would treat and the next week they'd come back and it was almost like I never touched them. Their head oh, was really, so tight. relatable. <laughs> yes. Their was just as tight. The shoulders were just as tight. And they would say, I felt amazing when I left your office. I felt great for an hour or two or a day or two or three. And then it all came back and it's exactly the same. And so that started to kind of say, wait a second, open up your mouth. Let me see what's going on. And that's where I started being able to figure out who needed tongue ties and who didn't. So it's, it's kind of like it all started with my kids and then they taught me and then I'm going and, and learning more through the patient experience. Which is so huge. And I, I've told you that that was my problem for my whole life. I would go to all these different practitioners. I'd feel great for a day or two, sometimes a few hours, and then it would all slowly come right back. And it's so frustrating and exhausting and so expensive. I mean, I probably have spent 50 grand at this point on different 
osteopaths and all kinds of people like chiropractors, physical therapists, everybody, massage therapy, all of it. And, um, and so that, I mean, that has been something that has really helped post-surgery to see just the changes alone. Like I, I know you and I've talked about this, but like even just the front of my, like all the chest area and like all this tension and tightness and pulling forward has completely shifted. Other things have shifted too, but that is like shifted to the point where I don't even notice that anymore at all. So I feel like it's these things that you've just sort of come to just be accustomed to. You just, I am. right. Yeah. Uh, I almost, yes. I accept being broken. Totally. Or, or there's some silver bullet out there somewhere. There's some magical cure, some supplement or some point or something that somebody's gonna do and then all of a sudden it'll be better. And you know, we've talked about this, what is a tongue tie? You know, in my mind, it, it's, it's a hurdle that we can't get over. It's a barrier that we can't get through. It's a door that's locked and, and you are stuck in a pattern until you're able to pass through that barrier or pattern. You know, find it, fix it, leave it alone is the model in osteopathy. If, if we find something that's out of place, we should quote unquote, put it back in place and it should stay there. Right. And when it doesn't, we need to figure that out. And so now when patients come into the office and they have whatever pain they have, head, neck, shoulder, upper back, breathing, ribs, TMJ, whatnot, and I say, what have you done? And they've gone, I've done acupuncture, I've done physical therapy, I've done massage, I've done myofascial release, I have done, you name it, I've done it. And then I say, okay, how does it feel? It feels amazing. It feels great. And then I say, how long does it last? They're like, a couple of days. And then it comes right back that's kind of become the telltale sign that you have a tongue tie because the chiropractor, the acupuncturist, the osteopath, the, the trigger points, whatever's being done should work. Those providers are diagnosing correctly and applying the right therapeutic, but the body doesn't respond in the way that it should because of the tongue tie. Yeah. So sometimes you get the tongue tie release and then you go back to the chiropractor, you go back to the massage therapist and you're like, oh my God, now it works. Right. And that was actually really interesting. One time we did a, a release on a patient. She was in her sixties. Um, the pain management doctor stopped treating her because every time you put a needle in her neck, it would get stuck. The <sighs> muscles were so tight, it would grab the needle and, and he couldn't pull it out. It was becoming dangerous. So he said, I'm sorry, I can't inject your neck anymore. This is too tight. Oh. She had a rolfer who would work on her and had been working on her for 10 years. He would spend two to three hours just in her neck and her shoulders, and he could never get through it. We ended up doing a tongue tie release on her, and we did it in two stages. So when the second stage happened and he came with her, I was like, who is this guy? And she's like, oh, that's the rolfer. And he looked at me and he's like, I'm here because I cannot believe what I'm seeing. This woman has had this horrible neck for 10 years. I've been trying as hard as I can for 10 years. And now all of a sudden you guys release her tongue and I can get through her entire body in an hour and everything is like butter and everything is released. Like what the hell is a tongue tie? So <laughs> that has become, you know, the writing on the wall for me when other providers call me. And they're like, what are you guys doing? Because now all of a sudden what I'm doing is working. Right. That's where that barrier or that hurdle comes in. And, you know, the tongue tie is not the cure, the re or the release of the tongue, excuse me, the tongue tie is not the cure. It's the opportunity for change. Right. No, it makes so much sense to me. And I can so relate to so many aspects of what you're describing. And I, you know, that actually makes me think about other symptoms. Like what are other things that you've seen that are indicative of needing a tongue slash lip tie release? So we have to understand that the tongue is responsible in one way for shaping the oral cavity. It's responsible for reducing the height of the palate, expanding the dental arches, stabilizing the jaw. All of that translates into how do you develop your intake valve or your breathing apparatus. So many times tongue ties are related to sleep disorder breathing and airway issues because your tongue was dysfunctional and essentially you didn't grow a good intake valve. 
Many times there is pain involved in the face. Um, we released a young woman this week because she had a lot of facial tension. And the interesting thing is she's a contortionist. Oh. So her body moves all over the place. She's hypermobile like crazy. But for years of doing, you know, contortion and getting into really extreme positions, she could never move her upper thoracic spine. She could never access the area in between her shoulder blades and her face was always so tight. When you touch her, she's loosey goosey everywhere except right here where that cervical thoracic junction is. And when you go and you move her face, it's really, really tight compared to the rest of their body. So facial pain, dental issues, crowding, malocclusions. Oh, I had to have braces multiple times. Well, why didn't your teeth develop right? Oh, I had to have, you know, CPAP machines or visit with sleep specialists. Oh, well, why didn't you develop your intake valve? So when we go farther from the face and down into the neck, neck pain, thoracic outlet syndrome, because all of the nerves that are going to the arm come through the neck. And what the tongue tie does is it squishes your head and your neck in together. So those little holes that the nerves are passing through, they get squished too. So extremity pain, shoulder pain, um, numbness and tingling in the arms, wrists and fingers. Um, one woman came in for a tongue tie release because she said her tennis pro said, there's something really wrong with you. I've never seen somebody who can't move their shoulder that much and swinging the racket. Well, after we did a tongue tie release on her, the tennis pro's jaw dropped as her arm went all the way back here <laughs> to do an overhand smash. So upper extremity issues and then things that go down into the chest are, you know, this is a tube that goes down into either your heart, your lungs or your stomach. So sometimes reflux, sometimes swallowing issues, sometimes getting pills stuck in the throat or the feeling of like food gets stuck and choking in here. Mm, yeah. Chest pressure, tightness under the clavicles, like the tongue tie kind of like condenses all of this. So, you know, that could be shoulder pain, that could be rotator cuff kind of stuff or impingement things. Um, but pain in the shoulders, I always hold tension in my ears and, and a lot of pain in the upper thoracic spine. Um, there are some people who go further down into the body. Um, I often think that, you know, like things going on with the lower extremities of the pelvis are sometimes compensations. Um, but there are people who have, um, one woman said, I didn't know my calves would feel better. And I was like, well, what are you talking about? And she had a tongue tie release and she came in and she's like, my calves have been rock hard my whole life. And all of a sudden they are like butter. I had that same experience with my hamstrings and I never expected that. And I'm not saying that happens all the time, but there are distal changes that can happen. So it's, okay. it's <laughs> kind of from here to here, from lower in the chest to here, you kind of name a part and, and there could be a relationship to a tongue tie. But, you know, I, 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 I dislocated my shoulder and I have shoulder pain. You probably don't have a tongue tie or that's not causal, but I've had chronic pain since as long as I can remember, stiffness as long as I can remember, and it involves this, this, and this, and this. That starts to paint that picture that we should start looking under the mouth and or in the mouth and under the tongue. Yeah, under the tongue, like under the hood. Uh, totally. And I feel like I basically had all of those things. <laughs> So yeah, forever and ever. So anyone who's listening and you feel as though the, a lot of what you're saying is, you know, check, 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 then definitely, like you said, start looking under the tongue. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the tongue and the pelvic floor, if possible. I know you mentioned just now that there is you know, potentially compensation things, but I've had multiple pelvic floor physical therapists say to me after this, you know, what happened with your pelvic floor? And it was weird because I started spotting on the day of the procedure and I spotted for like four days and that does not happen to me mid in the middle of my cycle. It just never happens. So, um, and I felt like all of this release, like tension release. So can you talk about that? Like what, what's going on with our tongues and our pelvic floors? Your feet are connected to your head. So right. your body is a unit. Um, first day of medical school, after six hours of sitting in a lecture hall and being nervous that you've gotten way in and over your head, we had a doctor bring three people up onto stage and have them try to bend over and touch their toes. They barely got beyond their waist. Everybody in the audience laughs. And then he puts three golf balls on the stage and has them roll on the bottom of their feet. 
for about 30 seconds on each side and then they all touch their toes and everybody in the audience gasps. So there are lines of tension that run throughout your entire body. These things are like superficial back line, deep front line, deep back line. So there are connections all throughout the body. And the bottom of your foot is actually connected to the top of your head through something called gala aponeurosis. So it kind of goes back to this idea that we're all squished and no tongue tie is perfectly midline. So I tend to see more tension usually pulling on the right, going into the right side of the body with tongue ties. Um, and that can cause a spiral or a compensated pattern where your body has to shift in order to get your eyes on the horizon, which can cause pelvic unleveling. Mm -hmm. So if your two anonymate bones are asymmetric or disproportionate in where they are in level in reference to the horizon, you're putting an unequal tone on your pelvic floor. So the rectum, the vagina, the urethra, they're all supposed to be these orifices that are circular, but all of a sudden you start to create an oblique or a misshapen orifice form and function are interrelated. So many times tongue tie releases change constipation. Right. And that kind of floored me. That's just parents coming back with young kids being like, they've been constipated since birth. We're trying to rule out Hirschsprungs, which is a disease in the, the colon. And we're looking at GIs and biopsies, but what the heck you did a tongue tie release and now they poop effortlessly. So that's pelvic floor as well. I don't know if there's a hormonal change that happens when stress changes and the cortisol response in the body changes, because you and I have talked about this. There's a relaxation that happens after a tongue tie release where your body is a lot more capable of taking stressors. So yeah. is that the kind of letdown of the body? I'm not a hundred percent sure, but there's been enough cases where it's either constipation changing, bowel habits changing, breathing in and accessing the diaphragm or intercourse um, and dysperinia or painful intercourse changing um, and then menstruation having really bad cramps that changing where people were like I used to be in bed for five or six days and now all of a sudden my cramps come and go and they're gone in a day so I don't know the exact reason but something is happening and, and the only thing I guess I could say is that the body is interconnected so there's some fascial system or stress response that does change in response to getting that tension released. Yeah, I mean, I distinctly remember this moment laying on this chair and my whole body is just relaxing in ways that it, in my whole adult life, it just never did. I just had never experienced anything like that. I could immediately feel muscle tension, like just, it felt like it was just sort of melting out of me. It felt like melting butter. And, uh, and so, yeah, it makes so much sense. It makes so much sense that these chronic or these restrictions create this chronic stress response your sex hormones absolutely respond to that. And so there's there's a knock-on effect and that goes on for years. So it makes right. sense. And this last period I had after uh, the release was totally effortless. Like there were zero right. problems. So yeah, it, it really that's, is incredible. That's an interesting word though. You know, prior to a tongue tie release and another word that anybody listening can kind of think of is like, it's hard. It's yes. hard to reach up into the cabinet. It's hard to paint the wall. It's hard to sit up straight. I'm exhausted just being. And the body has to do so much extra when it's an inefficient locomotion or we have to guard nerves or we have to protect our airway. If our airway is getting squished because of a tongue tie, we're gonna go into a head forward posture to open up our airway. That's not a neutral posture for our body and a head forward position puts a lot of strain into your back. So that effort in being, that effort in doing normal activities, that's not fair. We should all get a body that works <laughs> and somehow getting a release, all of a sudden people come in and they'll say, sitting up is effortless. Breathing is effortless. I get floored by exercise intolerance. I have a lot of patients who will say, People keep telling me I'm out of shape. I try to go to the gym. I go to a personal trainer. I go to a physical therapist. And when I do the workout, I feel worse. I actually feel really bad for a week, but then I push myself to try to get better because I'm so deconditioned, but the more I do it, the worse I get. And then all of a sudden I feel like a failure. Then they get a tongue tie release and they're working out four to five days a week 
no recovery time. They don't feel that stiffness or that building of tension in their body. All of a sudden, all those movements become effortless. So there is a, a reduction of the amount of strain that you have to put into the body and just regularly being when you're tongue tied. So totally, totally. I mean, I think about people always telling me to sit up straight and my back would start to hurt from just sitting up straight, just sitting how I was normally supposed to sit. And so it was just this constant struggle in my life of not knowing what to do and then just ended up slouching over. <laughs> Because just you gave can't up win against yeah. gravity, and then right. you put a tongue tie on top of that, and tongue ties accelerate gravity and just pull you down. You lose at some point. Yeah, you do. Some people don't have symptoms of a tongue tie or recognize tongue tie after injury. So sometimes you're doing fine, and all the pieces in your body are stacked just so, or your compensations are working really good. Mm -hmm. You get into a 40 mile an hour car crash and you get whiplash. One guy didn't have any tongue tie symptoms until somebody hit him over the head in a bar with a bottle. And then all of a sudden he had concussions and things like that. And he could never get his body back after trauma because now the tongue tie was completely decompensating through his body and he was struggling until he got a release. So sometimes we're sitting there with a the tongue tie and we don't even know it. Right. You know? And, and your body's fine until some sort of trauma happens. And then it kind of wakes us up to like, why can't I get better? Yeah. And that, that like effort. Yeah. And it doesn't help that no one seems to know about this. So this is what has been really interesting. And I've told you this throughout my experience of sharing this and my Instagram reel going viral. And I mean, it's had like 3 million views. So it's really funny. It's you and your voiceover telling me all about my ties right. in my mouth. And I, you know, and the, I've told you this too, the, the comments from people, there's been a lot of people who are uh, in the dental specialty and they are, totally rebuking everything that we're talking about in this video and there they there's like no science apparently so there's a lot of this pushback i've sensed from lots of people in that industry being like there is no science this is all fake and uh, he's just trying to make money off of you i got that comment the other day yeah. dr guys is totally I'm ripping me now. off yeah <laughs> you're ripping me off dude <laughs> Yes, clearly, you know, so there's all this stuff. And so I'm, I'm curious about that side of things. Like, why is there such a lack of understanding of, of this? And I know for listeners, they're hearing this for the first time and probably freaking out. Right. So, um, education, you know, so through medicine, you are taught the, the past history of medicine and, and new information in medicine is not written in the old textbooks. Right. And there's so much dogma and there are so many algorithmic approaches to medicine and to health. I think most of the listeners will agree, you know, Western medicine is the greatest in the world if you are dying, you know, if you get hit by a car, if you are in a life threatening situation. But we don't go to our primary care doctors to get well. Right. We go to our primary care doctors when there's a problem. So we don't really put a lot of emphasis on avoiding or preventative medicine other than like, you know, colonoscopies and, and screening mammograms and things like that. So the literature does not support it. So the people don't read it. So they don't believe it. So they don't practice and they don't go out there and, and, and try to see if it works. It doesn't work. It's, it's, it's in the book. The book says it's non-significant. So I luckily had this experience of suffering and chronic pain for 20 years. And then somebody released my tongue and my chronic pain was gone. That was a slap in the face. I watched my children suffering. And then somebody said, go get a tongue tie release. And they did. And all of a sudden they thrived in front of my eyes. Then you start talking to like-minded people who give you information. And even in the people who think that there is significance of tongue ties and, and oral restrictions, there is a lot of different opinions. So there's no consensus out there. There's no place that I can go and Google and have a concise understanding of what a tongue tie is. What's the difference between a tongue tie release and a baby? a five-week-old, a two-year-old, a seven-year-old, an adult, an adult who's had trauma, an adult who has breathing issues. There are so many variables 
that nobody is taking the time to say all these variables matter. They just want to go release tongues and see a result. They want to have a predictable algorithm where you come in, I see tie, I release it, and I can tell you how you're going to respond. You and I have talked about this, and I've almost, with Dr. Kundel, gotten up to 200 patients that we released. Nobody's the same. No two patients are exactly the same. No two patients approach pain the same way. No two patients are able to do the homework or have the financial means to support themselves or have the same backstory or history that brought them to the tongue tie release. It is so many complicated variables that it is hard to wrap your head around. Um, so when my father-in-law retired from his ENT practice, he had a library of books. He's an ENT, he's a surgeon. And when I went into his library of books, I went into Ankyloglossia and I looked at that part in the book and when it said ankyloglossia had nothing to do with anything, maybe speech, maybe feeding, um, I ended up throwing that book away and I got rid of about a 200 books and I kept two. Two books said that there might be some sort of relationship to oral facial development and, and maybe with feeding and breathing. And, and, and so there's a dearth of information. So I think we're starting to see more providers stepping out and experience this on their own. Yeah. More people having personal experiences where once you go through it, you can't go back. I can't unlearn what I've learned from all these releases. I don't have to be convinced about tongue ties being significant because I've watched it over eight years change people's lives over and over again. But I am that provider. Many body workers haven't had a tongue tie release. They haven't had a kid failure to thrive and all of a sudden thrive or airway kids suffocating every night and I'm holding their trachea open, open while they have strider. And all of a sudden that goes away. So there's a personal experience that drives your kind of like hunger for knowledge. And, and so even if you were to say my ENT knows about tongue ties, well, do they know about lip ties? Do they know about buckle ties? Do they do a suture? Do they do a laser? Do they do a scissor? It's, it's just, there's so many complex algorithms that for somebody who doesn't know what they're doing to just jump in and kind of have an understanding of all this, it's really complex. So um, no, we're not trying to make money off of you. We're trying to help you. Um, and that comes from a place of like, I was helped from my experience and I'm trying to disseminate that and spread that to other people there are people out there that do unfortunately abuse their patients. I have a patient that's been my patient for many years in Connecticut and circumstances changed for her and she had to move to Florida. She called about two months after she got to Florida and she said, I'm struggling. I'm in so much pain. There's something wrong. I was like, well, what happened? She had a phrenectomy done. So she went down there. She started seeing a myofunctional therapist. She saw her once. She said, you need to go get a tongue tie release. She went to a dentist who did kind of a bad job. The myofunctional therapist didn't know what to do and how to fix her. The dentist didn't know what to do and fix her. So they just kind of washed their hands of her. Oh no. I never suggested that that person needed a tongue tie release because she had so many other medical problems that preceded her getting a tongue tie release. She wasn't ready for it. Mm. So some of the body workers out there or some of the myofunctional therapists out there, they're not physicians. So they don't know how to look through a medical history. They don't know how to look at a patient and assess their health status. They're just assessing if they have a tongue tie or not. So this is where as an osteopathic physician who can use my hands to feel tension in the body, but I also went to med school, delivered babies, was in an ICU. So I know how to look at somebody and say, you're ready for a release and you're not. And so there's not a lot of providers like that who can look at a patient and assess and figure out when's the right time for you to do it and, and how to do it. The ENTs tend to be the ones doing a procedure or a dentist tends to be the one doing the procedure. They don't have a lot of office visits where they educate you or evaluate you. They just look and see if you have a tongue tie or not and they do the release. So there needs to be more physicians who can direct this? And I think that's where the big problem is. And instead of just saying like, no, this is you know garbage or BS, or we're trying to get money out of you. I think people should start saying like, 
there's enough people talking about it. Like, why are we talking about it? Why are we having it done? Why are we continuing to do this if, if it didn't work? Yeah. You know, wouldn't all the people, wouldn't you and me be going like, I've been damaged. I'm worse off. Don't, everybody don't get a tongue tie release. You're going to get worse. Like we'd be screaming from the top of the mountains. Yeah. Some people do do that because they go to an improper situation where they don't have a positive outcome and they go online and they say it's bad. Yeah. Which that's we've seen. Of, and that's where a lot of the comments may be coming from. I've never been the same since, or my kid's not been right since. Well, unfortunately, it probably wasn't done the right way. Yeah. You know, that is the problem. That's where I tend to get mad. And, and you know, I would love to drive down to Florida and kick this guy in the shins and tell him he screwed up. But, you know, it's, it's, it's too far of a drive. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, it is. And you're busy. No, and it and it really does speak to the thing that I really wanted to get to on this, which was what is the best way? You know, what is the best way to do a procedure like this? And you know, speaking of the team that you need and what's involved in preparation for this surgery, and then what happens post -oper post surgery and things right. like that. It's really difficult. Um I would put myself in a category of a unicorn. I have a, an osteopathic colleague who's out in Colorado. His name is Daniel Lopez. He, he is very similar in a way of what I am. We're both physicians. We both have hands. We can both evaluate. We both have had personal experiences with tongue ties. We both have kids with tongue tie releases. There's a dearth of physicians like that. So when we get into the team, we need a body worker. We need a myofunctional therapist who can retrain the oral function. And then we need somebody to do the procedure. Sometimes if we don't have somebody directing the ship, we can get a body worker who moves the body around. But if they don't know how to do wound healing, if they don't know how to do the proper stretches, it might not work as well. Um, it, 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 it's really tough. What I would say is if somebody is gung ho to do a release on you tomorrow, that's a big red flag. Somebody who says, yes, you have it. Yes, your child has it or your family member has it. We need to start working on your support structure and we need to prepare you for your release. That's where you start to feel confident in your team. Unfortunately, there's not enough people who do the provide or the revisions like an ENT or a dentist and body workers and my, that trio is not easily available if you go across the United States or out of the country. So is there one part that is more significant or more important? No, we can't do these releases without the myofunctional therapist. We can't do these releases without the dentist or the ENT. We shouldn't do these releases without somebody who can do the body work. So if you don't have that right setup, maybe you need to wait. And I think that's important. Sometimes people feel desperate and they, they just want to get it done now. And, and, and that is a recipe for disaster. You know, I had somebody fly up from Florida, wanted me to diagnose their tie and release it the next day. Oh, wow. And I literally looked at the person's feet and they were engorged with blood, like fluid. He, he couldn't even stand on one leg. The guy couldn't eat more than ground beef and blueberries. He was so disabled that he needed a back brace to hold himself up. And I was like, you have a tongue tie, but you really need a lot of work before you are ready. So if there was one person that is is critical, it's somebody who can evaluate your health and go from there. That might not be a body worker. Maybe that is just your primary, but they've had a tongue tie release or they've had a kid who's had a tongue tie release. So they at least can say, all right, you, you are medically okay to go and do it. That could be a physical therapist if we're talking about just structure. That could be a chiropractor if we're talking about just structure. But as far as like an ENT telling you that your skeleton's okay, or a dentist telling you that your neck is in alignment or you're, you're in the right postural alignment, there's not enough people. So, so we really do need that trio. So um, sometimes that means traveling. And sometimes what that means is saving money 
and doing it right and doing it in two years from now. And sometimes that means reaching out to the local Ralphers or the local chiropractors or the local people that we have as our assets around us and optimizing ourselves with them so that when we do travel to some group or team, we're ready. Yeah. So that we don't show up on their doorstep and go, holy crap, I have months of, of to-dos before I can get my release. Like, no, 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 I just need a little tune-up and a little directing and I'm ready to go. So... <clears throat> Sometimes it's reaching out and doing like telehealth or Zoom consults with professionals and then getting like, what do I need to do in order to be ready? And then I'll fly out and, and take two to three weeks off. That's a lot of commitment to get off of work. So um, it's, it's, a, it's a tricky process. It certainly is. And what do you think about um, in terms of the cost? Insurance generally covers it because I hear a mixed bag. I hear that sometimes they'll cover it, sometimes they won't. And it, that also is challenging for people, particularly in the US where that's our model. I, I think that it's safer to plan that most of this would be out of pocket. Right. And if that is the case, and that's how you set up your timeline and kind of like, you know, preparing for this whole process, you're gonna put yourself in the position to say, I'm gonna do what I have to, rather than, oh, I've only got such and such amount of money, where can I skimp? Where can I cheat? Where can I avoid? That's a, that's a bad outcome waiting to happen. So. If, if we're lucky and it does get covered, that's a bonus. I would say, you know, when you talk around the three, $4,000 range, sometimes that's two out-of-pocket epidurals. You know, sometimes that's years of going to the chiropractor or the osteopath. You know, when I see somebody with a tongue tie, um, I used to wait, you know, eight years ago, seven years ago, I used to say, you know what? I'm going to try doing what I know how to do and we'll see if I can unwind you. And if I can make you better, then good. If I can't, then we'll start looking at this tongue tie stuff. I would waste about two or three months. I would waste their money and their time if I knew they had a tongue tie. So now as soon as somebody has it, I'm like, you have a tongue tie and this is what we have to understand. If they don't want to have a release, I'll say, happy to treat you. This is what you'll experience if you don't have a tongue tie. I'll treat you and things will get better. We'll do ergonomics, you'll stretch, you'll move differently and you'll get better. But if we keep doing everything that's right and your pain keeps coming back, we've proven that we've got a tongue tie. So you don't want to skimp. You don't want to go for the person who's in network because they're in network, but they don't really have experience in doing adult phrenectomies. Kids is a different story. Kids usually need two or three manual treatments before, two or three manual treatments afterwards. And the majority of the work with kids is the lactation consultants, the IBCLCs, the, the Mayo people, the SLPs. Like they've got to do a lot of the work to retrain the kid's mouth. The dentist or the ENT does the one-time procedure. The body worker people do a couple of things. Um, it gets a little tricky when a kid's failure to thrive and you got to hold somebody's hand through that process. So um, I, I wouldn't bank on insurance covering it, but if it does happen, that's great. Yeah. This is all really, really helpful information and answers so many of the questions that I've gotten. Um, in terms of the procedure, <laughs> I wanted to talk a little bit about my experience of having COVID like two weeks prior to the procedure. And actually when I got COVID that weekend, I was like, I was supposed to have the procedure that following Friday. So five days later, and I remember being really upset because now we had to reschedule things. <laughs> Right. And thinking, what if I get a, a negative test by Thursday? I right. I can just get right into the office and do this. What? <laughs> What's wrong with me? I was out of my mind, clearly. And then we did it two weeks later. And I'm now, today actually makes five weeks since I had the procedure. And I still have soreness and some issues with the tissues. <laughs> And so that's, you know, something that I wanted to talk to you about as well, because that's also something I think people should consider if they happen to have COVID or even any other virus, I suppose, really, because it could potentially impact their healing. 
Well, it, it goes back to the fact that every person is different. And, right. and like when I talked about like, this is uncharted territory with COVID and tongue ties, like that hasn't ever happened before. And, and I've never had a person that had COVID, you know, the months leading up to a release. So as we went through this, it was kind of new information and how do we tackle this? So providers who are inflexible, providers who are we going to do it this way and it's a cookie cutter and it's an algorithm I think that's a red flag mm. and when something like this comes up we need to be able to say I don't know what's happening and let's try to work through this and let's try to make this better for you and you know you and I have talked about delaying your second release until you're fully recovered rather than oh it probably has nothing to do with COVID let's just go in there and do it again so um I had a woman who had the worst strep throat of her life the next day because her kid came home with 104 fever from school. So there's a lot of things that happen post-release that aren't anticipated and need to have that support team around you so that you can get out of it safely. You know, and this is where a lot of the myofunctional therapists do a great job with like the homeopathics or the calendula hydrosols or the supportive, you know, cell salts that help the tissue heal. That's all stuff that I am starting to learn about kind of because of what you've gone through. So you're teaching me and somebody who's willing to sit there and say like, I don't know what's going on, but let's try to work through this. And, and full disclosure, your experience is giving me information for the next time that somebody has COVID and is going to have a tongue tie release. So it's, it's new, but yeah. the ability to kind of say, wait a minute, I know what we did. I know what we did was not different than in the past when we have this result, that's an unexpected or it's an outlier. And now we need to start looking at different ways to manage this rather than just throwing the same book at you. Totally. I know. Yeah. It's been quite an experience, but I, you know, before we wrap up, I did want to talk real quick about the, the second procedure, because is that, is that fairly common for adults to need a revision as you call it? Um, because of, because we're adults and it's long, many years of dysfunction. It's, it's very common for anybody to have to have a second release. Sometimes especially in kids, a third release. Oh, okay. Kids, they end up in my office already having seen somebody and they got a sublingual release and it didn't fix the problem. And then somebody came along and said, well, you forgot about these buckles. So they go in and do just the buckles. And then they come into me because they're still not feeding right. But the whole problem is they have birth trauma and their mandible is subluxated. So I have to put their mandible back in place, kind of like open up the cranium. And then through that process, we realized that some of these tissues have healed back. Partly it's because it's a really small mouth and you got to get big fingers in there and manipulate them. And, and no person, you can attest to this, it's not comfortable to stretch your mouth after it's been lasered open. So do that to your brand new baby. Oh. That's really hard. So first time parents and tongue tie releases, kind of expect to have a second release or plan to have a really good team around you who can stretch it out for you and keep you honest because it's kind of like ripping off a band-aid you know if we do it slowly and painfully it gets worse but if we get in there and we do the job we don't have to get a second release so i would say it's very common the mouth is the most vascularized part of your body if I cut myself shaving, it's going to bleed for 45 minutes. If we bite our tongues today, it's probably going to be healed tomorrow. So this stuff heals really quickly. Right. So if you're not good with pain or for some other reason, like post COVID, you're in an, an increased amount of pain, it's probably going to grow back because you're not going to get in there and challenge those tissues and stretch it out. Let's just say a non COVID non painful experience when you go to the right providers, you're gonna have multiple spots in your mouth. And you're human, you're gonna pay attention to 80%. And one is gonna skip your radar. Maybe that's because you don't necessarily know how to engage it, or you weren't given the proper tools, or maybe somebody wasn't listening, or maybe they're trepid for one reason or another, or maybe you have to start a new job. 
and you can't necessarily stretch all day. Or maybe you're a, a young school kid and you're not going to do myofunctional for eight hours a day during school. So there's lots of variables. And I would say being prepared for doing a second release is really important. I would say if that's the case, as providers, we should set that into our algorithm and say, if you need a second release, you shouldn't be charged. So that way you're not sitting there going like, oh, you're trying to get my money, mm -hmm. right? And, and I think you and I can attest, like we've talked on the phone, we've emailed, we've, we've texted, we've had office visits. There's a lot of hand holding. So, you know, trying to take people's money would be charge per call, charge per phone call, charge, you know? So if you got a good provider, it's, I'm gonna take care of you. We're gonna do this release the right way. And it's not an extra charge if we have to go in there a second time. Sometimes there are some dentists out there that charge per spot. I, I don't really yeah. agree with that. That's, that would make me feel as the person on the table, oh, now we gotta do this one to ching $800. I don't trust you. I'm gonna leave that one because I don't have that money. Right. So we should have like a one cost so that we can go in there with confidence I know it's going to grow back a little bit, but that's okay. Let's get the most out of our first release. Let's do our best job. And maybe we have to go in for one buckle or a little sublingual scar tissue. And that's not a failure. That's not a failure on the part of the stretcher or the providers. It's sometimes it's the fast that you heal really, or the, the fact that you heal really well. So, yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah, I, I would 100% have shown up at your office five times a day for the first week. <laughs> for you to do what you did to me, although that was torturous, but, but seriously, I'd rather you do it than me because it's so much harder as a person doing it to yourself. That was one of my big revelations. Oh. What if your kid is like screaming and running around the house? You know, if, if, if yeah. you just bring a tongue tie release on a kid and then they're like, holy hell, what is this? And now you want to torture me more. That's not okay. So mm -hmm. We need our kids to be ready for this process. We need them to know what stretching feels like before and afterwards. We need to make them understand why it's important to do it yep. so that they're an active participant. So a lot of this comes from education. So yeah. the more we educate people about this, the more we know about this, the better our results are gonna be. For sure. Yeah. Okay, I will not take any more of your time. This was so, so valuable. I can't wait for everyone to hear this. And I just so appreciate you. And I would love for you to to share a little bit about your practice, if that's okay, just in case someone listening wants to come see you. Although I know you're very busy. I, I am I'm incredibly busy. And because of that fact, we've hired another provider to come into the office where my role in the office is probably going to be more geared towards tongue tie releases and like airway issues. So we are trying to structure it in a way where I can be available for more people. So awesome. at the moment, it's, it's, it's really limited. I have three kids and work a lot. So, um, but we are trying to make it more available for more people. But, you know, sometimes even just having a consult getting hooked up with the right people wherever you are can make all the difference so that is definitely something that is a little bit more easable for some than having multiple monthly visits and, and the whole process or procedure done in the office right yes i agree i know i was thinking about that too because for me um when you know, when I was booking all of this, like when I saw Dr. Kundal and then he suggested I see you, I was just so confused. And then when you, when we did that video and you're showing me all these different ties, I, my mind was so blown because not, nobody had ever pointed any of this out to me. So the fact that you're now focusing in on doing this mostly is so awesome. And what's your practice name and website? And just so anyone who's listening, if they're interested in reaching out, they can have that info. Integrative Family Medicine of Connecticut. So we're ifmct.com. We are in Stamford, Connecticut, and we have a small private practice where we try to have a comfortable personal environment to try to take care of people. And that you do. I want to mention one thing if there's a yeah. second, real quick. Yes. Um, that mention of like me going in there and, and finding all those places for you, it's important that you're listened to. As the patient, the provider needs to listen to you. I had a young woman come in, she's hypermobile, she's a contortionist, and when you look under her lips, you can't see anything. 
And I'm like, I don't know how tied you are. I can see this one, maybe this one. And she would grab her lip and pull it all the way down and say, there it is. And I was like, oh, there it is. So she wasn't saying I have ties and me saying, I can't see them. You don't need to be released. I was sitting there going like, oh, I don't see them. And she showed them to me and we found all these buried ties. And actually it helped us when we went into Dr. Kendall's office to have them released. I was like, show him how you stretch your face. Cause we're used to doing a gentle thing and she would pull her face all the way over. That helped him to visualize and know what to release. That helped me visualize and know what to stretch and what to treat. So you should be listened to as a patient. I think that's the most important thing. If you're myo, if you're body worker, if you're ENT, if you're dentist, if they don't give you options and they don't listen to you, if they're forcing it on you, it's not the right situation. Thank you for that. A message that I 100% can get behind because I talk to women about this all the time in my practice. So thank you, thank you. This was amazing. I so appreciate you. It happened. That's a wrap. Be sure to click that subscribe button to join me for more Girl Talk Gone Menstrual in upcoming episodes. But in the meantime, check out my latest period party episode. And if you're looking for a deeper dive into your hormones, go ahead and take my period quiz at nicolejardim.com quiz.